And then, um, and just so you're, um, I think you're already aware, but um, this group of uh, folks comes from a number of evolution um, education organizations. We have the NCSE teacher ambassadors. We have the TIES um, teacher core members here. And um, we also have members of the University of Florida's Human Evolution Summer Teacher Workshop Group, as well awesome. as a handful of other amazing biology teachers, I would say, and I'm admittedly highly biased here. This is one of the great um, collections of biology teachers in the country right now. So, and I'm, I'm honored to uh, get to know and, and be a part of all these awesome folks. And I'm especially honored that you would uh, find time to share with us. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. Um, well, first of all, I'll thank all of you for the work you do, and especially at this time. I know it's challenging, you know, having to shift your classes over to uh, remote learning. Uh, it's challenging at a lot of levels. What we're going through now, I, you know, we're all going through this together. Uh, but I think educators are certainly a, a part of our front line. And so thank you for that. And uh, thank you for your interest and passion for uh, evolution education. And I'm delighted to help you in any way that I can uh, this time and in other times as well, but this time is in particular. Um, yeah, so I am an evolutionary biologist at the University of Chicago. I'm in Chicago now. This is Antarctica behind me though. That's our latest field. Right? Um, but uh, I, uh, I work on the great transitions in evolution. I'm interested in the evolution of skeletons mostly. We, um, if you were to visit my lab, you would see we collect fossils uh, from Devonian rocks and rocks elsewhere in the world, um, other ages in the world. But mostly in the polar regions, we've been North and South Pole uh, area for a lot of reasons. We can talk about that. Um, but we target particular evolutionary transitions and we target expeditions to find fossils that do that. And that's kind of what led to the discovery of Tiktaalik rosea. This here, there you can see its orbits there. It's, yeah, cute little snout. Come on, look at that. That's a cute animal. Come on. I just want to kiss it. Anyway, so we have the whole... Um, we have about 20 of these things now, so they're not rare at all, okay? But we, it took us six years to find this. So we, you know, we chose a particular area because it had the right rocks to answer the question, and we went all in on that. Um, but my lab also looks at molecular biology. We look at Hox gene, Sonic Hedgehog, and other genes that are really important for controlling development. And we can ask the question now, given the molecular biology tools we have at our fingertips, you know, I could look at the entire genome of a fish, and I can look at the entire genome of a human, and I can ask what's different and what's the same, you know, and we can really get down to very precise levels. We can look at the genes that control development and we can manipulate those genes. We can edit them using CRISPR-Cas genome editing. We can swap genes among species. I can take human genes and put them in a fish and fish genes and put them in a mouse. I wouldn't do it in a human, door. But, you know, we can do those sorts of things. And so we can really ask and answer fundamental evolutionary questions. And so that's what my new book is about, um, Some Assembly Required. It came out the first week of the pandemic. Oh, newsflash, don't release a book the first week of a global pandemic. I'm, just, I'm not a marketing guy, but I can tell you right off the bat that that probably isn't the best thing for getting your word out, you know, because, you know, book, you know, it's, 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 it's about sales, but it's really about getting the word out, you know, and it's hard to get the word out. So that's why I've been focusing ever since my book tour is canceled um, and the press around my book essentially went away because it's all COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, I really went all in with teachers. You know, I have the time, you know, I have the energy. I know the teachers have the need for remote learning. So I've been dropping into classes. I mean, a lot of classes uh, this, uh, the last few weeks and we'll be doing it through mid-June. Uh, and, and if you want to drop in, just don't hesitate to email me at neil.shubin at gmail.com. I have a lot of requests. I'll try to squeeze you in. I mean, it's, it's really backed up now that the word got out, but I'll do my best to, uh, to work with you if that's something you're interested in. I've been doing like 30 to 45 minute drop-ins to answer questions. Um, so yeah, that's the work we're doing now. Um, we're continuing. This is Antarctica behind me. Look at that view. This is my favorite camp ever. Look at that camp. Come on. Look at the tents there. You, you can see in the distance uh, is the Devonian and Triassic rocks. Uh, we're there again to look at the Devonian, which is again, rocks of the right age and to find fossils that are at the cusp of the transition from life in water to life on land. We, um, we've been doing two expeditions there. We're working on Tiktaalik still. We're scan we've scanned all the bones, all the rocks. We found a new kind of Tiktaalik it's inside the rocks, which we're working on now digitally. We, fortunately, those files we have on our computers and we can work on them now that the lab shut down. We're continuing with molecular biology. I can answer that. Um, 
Yeah, so I am really, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to speak with you and answer whatever questions you have. I have some slides I can show, but you know, depending on what it, what questions you ask, I am more than happy to uh, to show slides around that. There was a chat question. What's the chat question? It says, can I get it? Yes, you may get an autographed copy of the book. Um, unfortunately, I have no mail room right now. So when as soon as my mail room, my office, that's where my books are. The whole, I I mean, if you want to send a self-addressed envelope and with the book, I, I can give you the information. Just email me, but. Um, when I have a mail room at work, I'll be more than happy to do it. And we should have our labs open probably in about two or three weeks. So, you know, partially open, you know, for smaller footprint, but, you know, at least I'll be in there. So, uh, yeah, more than happy to do that. And uh, so just don't hesitate to, to reach out. Anyway, so I brought some slides. I'm more than happy to talk through them, but a lot depends on what you're asking. And I'm happy to answer anything, whether it's about evolution, evolution education, my own work, uh, my own life, whatever. Uh, what other transitional fossils are you looking for? Um, my lab does a lot of things. So my um, next venture, Operation Next, uh, is to find the earliest vertebrate. Because if you think about the transition from non-vertebrate chordate, like a creature like Amphioxus or a tunicate or something like that, to an early vertebrate, like a lamprey or something, you're dealing with the origin of a skeleton. You're dealing with the origins of teeth. You're dealing with the origin of whole new tissue types. And we have a pretty good handle of that starting, emerging at the developmental and molecular level, but our fossil evidence is very poor. And people really haven't focused on that in a big way. So to me, that's an opportunity, you know? So I'd be looking at rocks about 480 million years old, a lot older, this would be early order mission. Like Cambrian, that's Operation Next. Uh, that, Cause that would be really, really huge. We, um, my lab is, you know, I started my career looking at, for the origin of mammals. When I was a graduate student, I was really interested in Triassic age ecosystems, about 210 million years old, because you see the origin of dinosaurs, crocodiles, turtles, mammals, all kinds of modern critters. So that struck me as a really important time period. And so we're still continuing a bit with Triassic work, but that's not the main focus. Um, my main focus is really in the Devonian and a little bit earlier. And the reason why is because I'm interested in the fundamentals of our body plan. So that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at right now. Feel free to, you, you can launch into your questions verbally. You don't necessarily have to type them. If it's easier to type them, if not, just launch in. Um, I would love to hear about the new tectonic you just mentioned. Yeah, so it's a funny story. Um, we had launched the tectonic expeditions. I call them the tectonic expeditions because that's what we ended up finding uh, in 1998. And um, the we had a great idea. Ted Deschler, my partner in all this, Farris Jenkins, another partner, the late Farris Jenkins, another partner in all this. We had the idea to work up there because the rocks were perfect, right? The right age, the right type. They were exposed. Nobody's worked them before other than oil and gas geologists who mapped them. So it was a huge opportunity for us. I mean, like 1,500 kilometers east to west across the Canadian Arctic on all this rock. Like if you're a paleontologist, it's a playground if you're interested in finding these kinds of fossils. But it took us a long time to do it because working up there is very hard. You only really have the month of July. Um, and we had a lot of setbacks along the way, you know, and we can go into what those setbacks are, but, you know, they're, um, you know, we, it was sometimes, some years, it was like one step forward, two steps back. But, so we had found an area, which I can show you pictures of in a few minutes. We found an area where we eventually were able to quarry out a lot of bones, and that turned into Tiktaalik. But we had bad weather that year. So we couldn't, and that quarry was about a mile from camp. And that would, would turned into a very hazardous walk in some of the weather that we had, because it can be really bad. So we ended up like just prospecting near camp, just like, because I just want to sit in my tent like for a whole week. I would just like put on my parka, put on my rain gear and get out of the tent, just like what I'm doing now, <laughs> only I'm without a parka, just to get outside, you know? And so um, I uh, went out and uh, this is before we found Tiktaalik. And uh, I was up there in lunch, just above camp, looking down at camp, and there was this boulder, and this boulder had some scales on it. I'm like, Ooh, okay, so I looked at it, and it had really funny looking scales. So I'll take this boulder, and there are a couple of pieces of bone around it. I collected them, wrapped them up, and went back, and didn't really take any notice of it. It was just kind of like, no big deal, right? You just find a lot of bone, find a lot of scales. We ended up collecting and taking it home. And um, a little while later, after we found Tiktaalik, so we found Tiktaalik three days later, so now we knew what Tiktaalik looked like. We saw the scales and I realized, oh, whoa, those scales that I collected, guess what they are? Tiktaalik. But they're not Tiktaalik. They're like a different Tiktaalik. It's Tiktaalik Beta 2.0. I'm like, oh, wow, that's wild. So brought them home. Uh, and But we had no way of getting into the rock. It was like a big boulder preparing it. We would have destroyed the fossils. We, we didn't know I think was in there. But then technology came to the fore. We, um, we have a high energy CT scanner in the lab now downstairs. 
And um, we scanned the boulder and guess what's in the boulder? Yeah, there's a jaw, there's part of the skull, there's, it's not complete, but there's a fin, uh, there's a shoulder, um, and it's clearly, it's smaller than, so it's about half the size of this one here. So, uh, and it looks different, the scales are different, the jaw is a little different shape, so it's clearly, it's probably a different genus. So that's what we're working on. We scanned it before the lockdown, and before we got locked out of our lab, and um, we have it digitally. And so we've been working on it as a team digitally for a bit. Um, and uh, one thing we're realizing is we have to scan it at a different resolution. So the scan we did was really just a searching scan through the boulder. Now, now that we know it's there, we got to really get into there um, with a higher resolution scan. So as soon as, th as things open up again, that's kind of priority number one for us. Um, the other thing I should say is um, this and this, which is the fin of TikTok, and the humorous, they're all online now. It's 3D files that you can print. So if you have a makerspace in your schools or you have a makerspace in your local community, you know, um, I can uh, send you the link uh, to uh, print out these things. So you can print out any of the, a lot of the bones that we already scanned. So that could be a good, useful, you know, educational tool if that, if that works for you. Um, I think what search, what will that search in Antarctica be for the earliest vertebrate? No, the, the search in Antarctica is for, um, uh, let me show you the search for in our Antarctica. Can I share my screen, John? Yes, I can. All right, we're in business. Uh, yeah, we're cooking with gas. The search in Antarctica is, is in Devonian rocks, and it's in rocks that um, that hold slightly older ages than the Tiktaalik. So, does everybody see this map of Antarctica? Is that up? Are we good? Yeah, good. So that's Antarctica, right? And as you know, and as you teach, Antarctica is a continent. So it's a continent with ice on top of it so the so the rocks are the mountains are poking through so you see these are mountains that are poking through the ice right and in some places those mountains are you know have devonian now wouldn't you know it i have no luck whatsoever devonian is at the top okay it can't, can't be just cut me a break can't be at the bottom no can't be it's at the top so uh, that's the my fate there we got to climb these mountains every day and camp is at six thousand feet so that gives you a sense of how high those those are. So we identified a series of places that have the Devonian age, 380 million years, so slightly older than Tiktaalik, which sits at about 375, has, um, have these areas here that we identified for field work. And so year one was 2016, 2017. Year two was last year. And what you see behind me is a site where, let's see which site is that. That's where that number two is, where the arrow is in year one. That's this site right here. So, um, and then year two, it's really pretty. Let me show you. No, I don't, I can't do it right now, but it, it's a different background. Anyway, so um, it's amazing. So where the rock pokes through the ice, you really do get marvelous exposures. Look at that. It's like the Grand Canyon. It's like the American Southwest, you know, only with glaciers. But that's the kind of exposures that are perfect for fossils, right? Because they're very gentle. And so if anything's weathering out, we'll see it, you know, any bones. And so that's what we did. Now there's a lot of problems because this is um, New Year's Day. Yeah, and so it's, um, it can be cold and snowy. It's Antarctica after all, let's, well, you know, let's not kid ourselves. So, you know, uh, there with the challenge is that, you know, for every working day we have, we probably have about two days stuck in our tents with uh, the weather. But it's really good enough rock that we can find, so we can work these sorts of exposures here. This is kind of from the last field season. <clears throat> and uh, we can blow it off and we can find all kinds of fish fossils. Now, we don't, we find articulated fish, like whole body fish, but sometimes we'll find them like this where they're splayed apart. And there's a, obviously a chapstick for scale, but we can we, we're finding tectonic-like creatures. We're finding early creatures called placoderms, which are armored fish. We're finding uh, sharks, early sharks. It's a real fauna here in the Lake Devonian, and this time period is really great because it's a time period when ecosystems are making the shift from being marine to being freshwater and terrestrial. So we're catching you know get a snapshot of the world as the ecosystems are shifting. So yeah, that's been that's been really great. Um, yes, yeah, so at least polar bears are not a hazard there. That's right. There is no polar bear hazard in, and there's no penguin hazard there because we don't even have penguins. This is the, so I get back here and everybody's asking, hey, did you see any penguins? I'm like, no, I'm the only person who's ever worked in Antarctica who's never seen a penguin because we're working on the ice plateau. There's nothing living. There's nothing multicellular there other than me and my colleague. You know, everything else, you know, it's all microbiome. That's about it. So I don't really see any animals uh, whatsoever. Um, so are the new fossils about Antarctica, Neil? Was actually yeah. where are you starting to look for your first vert? Where are you going? Oh, where would I do that? Yeah, that would be in Canada. Yeah, so that wouldn't Canada. be in Antarctica. That would be in Canada. Yeah, so the um, 
uh, Western Canada too, probably the Northern Yukon, that kind of thing. Um, those are sort of perfect areas. In other places, there's a sandstone in Wyoming that's a real candidate sandstone called the Harding Sandstone. There's others as well that are, um, but they're mostly up north. Um, not as north as tectonic sites, but still up there. So Somerset Island, which is up there, uh, Yukon Territory further to the west. So I have lots of, you know, I have lots of potential sites. Really can't do anything for an, at least another year and a half because, um, and that's not, not COVID related. It's because other commitments, you know, in the field and, uh, and, and kind of home. Um, do you plan on working with HHMI to make some new videos or educational material around the new book? Uh, we're in discussions about that now. Obviously that's affected by the COVID-19 thing. We had a plan. Um, but COVID-19 sort of threw a spanner into that, just like everything else. Uh, but yeah, we're, I talked to the HHMI about possibilities and we were batting ideas back and forth. Um, if teachers were to print 3D TikToks, what activities do you suggest we do with the 3D prints? Um, and I think what you can do effectively with it, and what, what something like this does, is you can use digital technologies to show a fish and uh, to show a tetrapod. You know, and you can link to that and then show this as an intermediate and what features are intermediate in it. You can ask students to identify, you know, what, how, why, how we identify this as an intermediate fossil. So it would mean resourcing it with some online stuff, but maybe from the videos we have with HHMI. Remember, we have a lot of those short videos that we did. What we did when we did the show is we did the three hours of the show, episode one, two, and three. And then we identified areas that teachers may want that we can do 10 to 15 minute shorts on. So we took parts of the show, but we also did special voiceovers for that. So you'll see they're all online at the HHMI site. So there's one on the Argent and Tetrapods, I think that would work really well for that. And then you can have the printouts um, in there and maybe an exercise around how do we identify a, a transitional fossil. Uh, uh, I created chapter questions for your inner fish I can share, that'd be awesome. I can't answer, I mean, I can answer as many as you want now if you like. Um, how do I know where to look geographically for like early vertebrates? Okay, yeah, so let me, this is, this is kind of how we work. So, you know, when you're thinking about places to find fossils, you're looking for three things. You're looking for rocks of the right age. You know, well, no, you begin with a question, right? Science begins with a question. So my question, you know, was the origin of land living vertebrates. But if I want to change it, I can say, well, the origin of vertebrates. So you begin with a question. That question then, sort of leads you to think about places where you might look. So you look for places in the world that have three things that might hold fossils to answer your questions. The first is rocks of the right age. For the origin of vertebrates, I can look at phylogenies that people have done. I can look at what fossils we know. And that gives me a window of time that essentially extends from late Cambrian through the Ordovician, much of the Ordovician. Great. Then you think about what environments are they most likely living in. That's a little harder here. You know, they're almost certainly not deep water marine, so we can cancel that out. They're almost certainly not fresh water because there's not a lot of fresh water exposures. I would get that that they're near shore marine, and I'd want near shore marine um, tidal ecosystems that are fairly rich in productivity, you know, that have a lot of um, organic material in them. And so I'd want that where they also are preserved as fossils. So it would mean finding a, a shale, a, a, a near shore marine shale that is. Um, and not relatively anoxic, that it doesn't have a whole lot of oxygen because that, that tends to preserve soft tissues really well. So anyway, that's so why I'd identify the right kind of rock at the right kind of age and then where they're exposed. And that's why when I answered the question about, you know, earlier, that's why Yukon and Somerset Island and the, and the Arctic, that's why parts of Wyoming might be good here. I'm the line Mike, you never know. Yeah, that's why we got, that's why we do the expeditions, right? <laughs> I mean, you know. Um, I think I've answered everything on the post here. What else? Uh, is this new fossil between Tiktaalik and Hunger Hanerpatan? Uh, on Hanerpatan, yeah. Um, um, uh, that, that's autocorrect. I love autocorrect. You should see some of mine. Um, uh, no, this is older than Tiktaalik. This is probably a little bit older. So it's probably a, a Tiktaalik a beta, <laughs> a beta version of Tiktaalik. Although we don't know for sure. We'll have to see. Um, uh, we often hear in the classroom that no one has observed speciation. Um, will you be, uh, uh, can we inoculate students against this misconception? Um, you know, speciation is something that is kind of trivial to be some, to some extent. Uh, we actually can observe proto-speciation genetically. We now know a lot about the genetics of speciation. That is, we know a lot about the genetics of reproductive isolation in vertebrates, and we can see how they came about. And we know this very well in fruit flies. So if you look at the 
you know, the speciation genetics of fruit flies, there's been amazing progress that's made there. They can show how reproductive isolation in the laboratory can arise really, really, really quickly when you focus selection on particular genes. So it's one of those cases where, no, we can observe the aspects of speciation in the laboratory. We can even observe incipient speciation in the wild. You know, and then we can look at it at the genetic level to ask how genetically, from a molecular level, how, how genes can control reproductive isolation or bring about reproductive isolation. So I think you can hit that from the level of field work, long-term studies. You can hit it from the letter, letter of laboratory manipulation, and you can also hit it from the level of molecular genetics. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot. And, and by the way, um, uh, Jerry Coyne, a colleague of mine here at the University of Chicago, has written a book on speciation, which is actually quite good. I recommend it. Um, Quite a bit. Um, um, Alan asked earlier about, um, are you seeing some new fossil rich formations due to climate change? Oh, um, uh, um, uh, yes and no. Um, not here. You'd think about it. But here, this part of Antarctica is kind of stable in terms of like ice growth. Um, parts of Antarctica are not. Part of, parts are like, changing very rapidly and something to be concerned about. But in this part of Antarctica, it's big kind of, this part of Antarctica, not so much. Um, in the Canadian Arctic, most definitely. So if you think about the Arctic, that's really witnessed just rapid climate change and sustain. So passages like Lancaster Sound, where explorers in the 1800s used to get you know, iced in for four years, now are open you know, for many months of the year. Like the Northwest Passage, you can just go right through. Um, and what that means is, of course, in some of the inland areas that we work, um, are exposed with, or have more rock exposed. So if you look at the aerial photos of the Tiktaalik site um, that we took, you know, a couple, four years ago, um, and you compare them to aerial photos that were taken, like, initially when the area was mapped during the Cold War, say, in, like, 1958-59, there's a lot of difference. So the glaciers have retreated along the head of the valley, exposing a lot of Devonian rock. Yeah, so if we were to work there in the 60s, we would have a little bit less rock to work on. Neil, I'd like to I'd like to um, ask a question regarding your your virtual time with students. Are you finding common threads that the kids like to hear about that they're asking you about? What what kind of things are they curious about? I will say that when I do these sessions, I'd say about eighty five percent of the questions are the same, um, which is really telling and really interesting. And you could say, well, why are you doing it? You could just tape it. No, it's the human contact that's yeah. really really important. So nothing replaces just, even if it's digital, just a real-time conversation with a fellow human. Um, yeah, the questions they want to know range from the very personal, you know, so some of the most common questions are, you know, how do you, um, are personal to the extent that how did you become, why did you become a paleontologist? How did you get interested in fish? You know, how did you get interested in science? How did you find a career in science? Um, and that's one class of question. Another class of question um, is about the Tiktaalik origin story, you know, um, so I go through that I have slides. I can do it with you guys if you want, but it's, you know, the origins, how we chose the place, how we worked it, how we, you know, how, what we did for each of those six years that led us to it. So they want to know that, how we interpret it. Um, some students uh, want to know um, uh, about uh, how I endure in field work. They want to know, like, what's it like living there? How do you prepare? You know, what is it like going for a year without finding fossils? How do you recover from that and stay active? That's a very common question. You know, how you just do day to day up there. Um, they want to know what the life of my a day in life is, you know, like a normal day, <laughs> uh, like a normal day in the life. Um, you know, so like that kind of thing. They want to hear about that. Uh, often some, some students will ask about science and religion a little bit. Um, that's kind of one of the lower frequency questions, but it does come up. Um, uh, they ask a lot about the future. What does it hold? You know, what's, um, what's the future of the human species? I would say that list right there is about 80 to 85 percent of the questions that I get from the, um, from the schools. Uh, I, I've had some oddball ones. I've had one student say, you know, if you found a penguin in your freezer, what would you name it? I don't know about that one, but you know, you know, so you do get a few off the wall ones, <laughs> but it's all good. Um, but most of them fit into that line. Um, I'll get stuff about other transitions. People want to know more about evolution. They want to know about, uh, is, I can't, how do you, if I wanted a career in science, how would I go about it? A lot of them kind of want to know. 
a lot of educators ask that too. You know, what can I, how, what kind of guidance can I provide? And, and where I, where I talk about that is my own origin story, which was really based on having great teachers in high school and college, but importantly, teachers who or or contacts which were able to link me to internships. So, you know, when I was in high school, I had a, a, a teacher who was pretty um, active in finding opportunities for high school students to do summer work, you know, and so I volunteered and things like that. And then when I got to college, I had a professor who was able to link me to a um, to re, to an internship at a museum, you know, and then one thing led to another. But I think having those opportunities, is, they were really critical for me. And I think they're critical for students the more we can do that, you know, based on what your local resources are. But remember, these students have much more, you know, I was a high school student in the 70s. Um, these students have much, much more resourcing than, you know, we had, right? I mean, I had this internet thing. You know, I mean, I had to write letters, you know, <laughs> I had to go to the library and, and hold those, those things called books, you know, where you cut your finger with the paper, you know, all that stuff. And um, it was, you know, and, and so, but they can do it. They can do web searches. They can do emails. They can connect to other people. You know, they have so many. So I encourage them to be fearless, you know, and work with their teachers and reach out and that kind of thing. Uh, Cause I, you know, as a, when I get an email from a high school student or a uh, young college student, you know, looking for an opportunity, you know, more often than not, I'm encouraged by it, you know, and I'll see what I can do. I can't always accommodate them, but I can always refer them to somebody else if I'm full up, you know. Um, yeah. Dr. Shubin, I wanted to share, you've really influenced a lot of kids here in Miami Dade. Oh you my said, gosh, you got a head there. You got a good TikTok head. That's gorgeous. You sent that to me years ago with um, a letter. Oh my gosh, uh, that's 2010. Holy cow. Yeah, and every year my kids read Your Inner Fish, and oh, they awesome. love it. This is, I actually snuck into my school today to take this off the wall. Oh, I love it. Yeah, so that's the specimen here. That's the <laughs> specimen. Yeah, that was when we were, you know, we just had a simple mold of it, you know. Um, kids, oh, awesome. Every year I have this in the classroom, so they, they love it. But um, oh, I'll be tapping you for, to see if you could do a presentation for um, teachers and students across the country through our, Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. Sure. So just Reach thanks out. so much for so many years of teaching material. I oh, love doing it. So it's really fun. Um, the people on your team, I'll try to get to the questions that are coming out. I'm going to, I'm missing a few. Um, does your work with genetics change your perspective on speciation? Um, yeah, it does. I mean, so my work on genetics really changes how I think about morphological transformations. And that's kind of one of the topics of this, my new book, Some Assembly Required, that's kind of a big piece of it. You know, how genetics and fossils work together. Um, the, uh, uh, what it does is it really shows how change, rapid change can happen at the genetic level. When you study evolution in the laboratory, what becomes very clear is that evolution is capable of much greater rates of change than what we observe in the fossil record really i mean it's enormous so the question is not becoming like, how did evolution you know bring something about in x number of years the question is why did it take so long <laughs> you know? it's like and that's kind of when you think about genetics and artificial selection and all these things you know so that's kind of how i approach it but genetics definitely does affect how i look at the world but being a paleontologist changes how i think about genetics right because it makes me ask questions that i normally wouldn't ask if i if i didn't have that you know paleontological background um, I would love to hear more about the site. You mean the, the, the Antarctic site or the um, Arctic site? Which one? Whoever asked the question, it was, let's see, Melinda. Oh, I can show pictures. Oh, Antarctica, yeah, yeah. Um, so the sites here are, um, are pretty remarkable because you have up there at the top, you have Devonian. Now these rocks were formed in ancient rivers and streams. These are ancient Delta sediments. It's called the Aztec sandstone. So it's really kind of wild. Here you are in Antarctica, you're cracking these rocks, right? But in the rocks is a tropical world, okay? I mean, talk about a juxtaposition of present and past. And the reason for that is the climate has changed over time, we know that, but also that continental drift, what is today at the South Pole was up towards where Australia uh, is to, you know, in the Devonian, you know, so the Antarctica has shifted, you know, south and, and in so doing has, has changed its climate dramatically. So what we're seeing is a tropical world up there. And those sites are in sandstones and siltstones, which are, um, which can be challenging to work. Honestly, very challenging to work because it's, you know, you don't have much time. So I'm used to like lying flat prone on the rock and cracking and it just, it gets too cold. 
It's just way too cold. So I work in spurts. Uh, all of us do. You know, you work for like 10 or five or 10 minutes, <laughs> wait for a little five or 10 minutes to warm up, you know, do another five or 10, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Cause you never really want to get cold. You know, that's kind of the big thing. So it changes how I work a little bit. Um, the sites are usually what we have are when we see a site is there's bone at the surface and then we'll try to find the layer that those bones come from and you know, we'll crack the rock and, and see the skeletons and so forth. Are there any particular collections, policies, stipulations that you hear to as a scientist? Yes, especially if it involves collecting fossils within a community's land. Most definitely, that's huge, huge. So in, in each region is different. So when we work um, up in the Arctic, um, we uh, have our, we have to get Canadian government, federal government permits, the province of Nunavut permit, Inuit permit. We have to get a, a land use permit. We have to do an environmental impact um, assessment permit, a water use permit. Oh, it's, you know, long, I mean, it's permits on permits and they're all in triplicate. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing permits when, you know, I, uh, when I'm uh, to, to, to prepare for my work. I spend most of my time doing permits. Um, and, um, and, and the rules there are pretty clear. That is, they want us to be min low impact camping as much as possible. We're good at that. Uh, they want us to disturb wildlife as minimally as possible. And that includes our overflights and helicopters and so forth. We, we, we try to be good at that. It's kind of hard to control that entirely. Um, and uh, we, we obviously need to run clean camp. And then importantly, all the fossils we find, once we do the science, get returned to Canada because they're property of Canada. So all the tectonic specimens have been returned to the uh, Canadian Museum of Nature where they're in the collection now. Uh, and, and everything else. We found like 18 different, 17 different species with tectonic. We prepared them and as we write papers on each species, we send the fossils back. We drive them back to Canada uh, for to be in the collection there. Now Antarctica is very different. Antarctica, there's the Antarctic Treaty and we get the permit through um, the U U.S. Antarctic program. But there we have to run the ultimate clean camp. That is nothing is left behind. So all waste, including human organic waste, goes. Nothing, there's, we have, we cannot leave any sign that we are in the field. So we spend about um, a full day on the final day, if it's good weather, just kind of cleaning everything up, even in the snow, moving rocks back, you know, so there's no evidence that we were there and it's being tight. It's nothing is left, no, nothing left behind, no trace. And so that, that kind of creates, um, you know, it's a challenge because it makes the in normal challenging place even more challenging, but it's really important because Antarctica is a special place. They're, they're trying to they're, do their best to, to conserve it. The people who are on your team, are they graduate students? Yeah, a little bit of, a little bit of everything. Um, I've had mostly graduate students. I've had postdocs. I've had college students. I've had, most of I had, well, in Antarctica, we take a mountaineer. So we have to take a mountaineer because of the crevasses and climbing and stuff like that. Um, take a mountaineer. Um, yeah, we've had, well, obviously the film crew when we did Interfish, we had a uh, four person film crew. That was, that was wild. Uh, but I usually take a small crew. Usually my crew is about uh, six to eight people. The year we did the Interfish uh, filming up in the Arctic, uh, we had 11. Um, and, you know, it's because we had the, the you know, sound and film and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I take a smallest crew because I'm in six persons, my ideal crew, because I, we don't need a camp manager. Everybody can take care of themselves um, and everybody likes to pitch in and cook and that kind of thing. So, and it's a uh, bring people I know. My four-year-old wants to know why fish have the number of fins they have. Well, there's a hydrodynamic answer to that, but they don't always have. So the, basically the number of fins the fish have can vary a lot. So you have four paired fins, right? Two in the front called the pectoral fins two in the back called the pelvics, but you also in many fish have unpaired fins. You know, you have a median fin, you have an anal fin, there won't, you know, singletons that sit in the body and they control the yaw and the pitch and the forward motion along with the bends in the back of the, of the, of the animal. They also, the tails of fin too. So there's lots of fins, they have fins on fins. If you look at the fossil record, the number of fins can vary quite a bit in, in fish. And, and again, it's related to their locomotion and you know, what they need to do. Some fish use their fins to walk on the bottom of the water. Some fish use their fins to propel themselves. Some fins use their fins, some fish use their fins to, um, to turn and pitch. Others use their fins as sensory structures, almost like antennae, right? Feeling around in the water. So there's lots of functions for fins, you know, and fish are doing kind of every, if they can do it, they will do it. Um, 
Do you think there is any pushback on scientists who choose to be science communicators to the public? Well, if there is, I haven't felt it yet. Um, you know, um, I, you know, so we've, we've actually, I think we as a community have evolved since the days of Carl Sagan. So Sagan, you know, was a great scientist. I mean, an amazing scientist. You just think about the stuff he did for the Mars missions and others. And I mean, real fundamental science. Um, he was also, you know, the scientific communicator, right? Cosmos, when I saw that when I was in high school, it was like, you know, my mind blown, okay? Um, but, you know, and Sagan came up for the National Academy of Sciences, which he deserved on scientific grounds. He, at the last stage, was blacklisted. And, you know, because you can do that in the final vote. You know, any member can sort of say, nope, stop it. And they did. A whole bunch of physicists and astronomers, you know, because he was spending so much time on Johnny Carson. You know, nowadays, I think there, we have whole awards in the National Academy, um, you know, for science communication. So if you think about, and, and they're making a real a presence of rewarding it as an enterprise. And if you look at people who've been elected in recent years, a lot of them are also scientific communicators, as well as, you know, scientists are contributing on the basic and applied science side. So I think we've, we, I think we've had a, uh, a shift in the landscape in a very big way, because I think scientists realize that, you know, we don't function in a vacuum. You know, we function in society and society pays a lot of our bills. And, you know, we have to really, um, we have to really contribute. So that's kind of one of the reasons why, you know, uh, and I, I do quite a bit of scientific communication, particularly nowadays during the quarantine. Um, but um, I think it's not, it hasn't hurt. I, I haven't felt that it's hurt my career at all. You know, um, uh, I haven't felt like, you know, I've been on any blacklist or anything like that. Uh, students really tr struggle with envisioning how massive transitions could possibly happen. You should see my new book, uh, some assembly required. Um, when you, when you explain to me, how do you personally explain how a process like this happens? Yeah. So I'll, I, I'll just, so here's the deal. And I think this is really important when you're you know, chance, when you're talking to your students, nothing ever begins when you think it does, because if you think about the transition from life in water to life on land, and you look at the endpoints, fish and tetrapod, you could say this thing can never happen. Think about what has to change. You need to have lungs, you need to have appendages, you need to have a neck, you need to yawn, and it could be a list as long as you're on, right? And if you think about it, if fish had to evolve all that stuff through natural mutation and natural selection, simultaneously, dead in its tracks. And the same thing would be true with the origin of flight and birds, the origin of humans, you name it, you name it. The reality is, Pretty much every feature that fish used to walk on land evolved in fish living in aquatic ecosystems, being good fish. Lungs came about eons before fish took their first steps on land. Lungfish, coelacanths, um, birchers, polypterus, and others already have lungs. And if we look at the phylogenetic history of lungs, lungs date to the early Devonian um, in the lineage that led to tetrapods. So they already had lungs. And if we look at tectolic and other critters, they already had arms and legs and wrists and, and necks and so forth. And why were they have these? These were fish that were living in aquatic ecosystems that had variable oxygen content and some lineage and these some lineages of fish evolved appendages to allow them to walk on the bottom of the water maybe even in the shallows you know and so when you think about it it's not that the origin of tetrapods involved the invention of many new things it meant using things that already were there for new purposes so that when the opportunity or the need came to invade land they already had all the tools to do it and the same thing is true with origin of flight. Feathers, wishbones, wrists, wing-like structures, high metabolisms, hollow bones, you know, pneumatic lungs, all that sort of stuff um, arose in dinosaurs who were not flying, who were running around. And they did it to be good dinosaurs. So what I'm saying is, you know, the great revolutions in the history of life don't wait for new features to arise. You know, that's, they're already, these critters were already being good fish living in aquatic ecosystems, such that when the ecological need came, they already could motor onto land. And that need is essentially, when you think about it, um, if you think about the, the world of the Devonian, water had lots of fish species, lots of them. Some of them big, some of them small. Pretty much all of them were carnivorous. So it was a fishy fish world. So water's a place which had lots of predators, lots of competitors, okay? And lots of food, it had, you know, lots of trade-offs. Land, however, had plants, had large invertebrates, but no predators and no competitors. So when you think about it, any change 
that allowed an animal to get into the mud flats or in the shallows away from all that to get them out of predators a predator rich out of a competitor rich environment and into an environment which has none of that and also has opportunities and they and the funny thing is they didn't have to evolve a whole lot of new things to do this that already exists in their fish so you know the transitions when you look at them that way all of a sudden they become a whole lot more a lot more plausible and that's this is not just true for the origin of um uh, of the origin of tetrapods. It's true for flight, it's true across the board. And the same principles apply to genes. Many of the genes that, you know, make our hands and feet originally arose in fish fins, you know, patterning fish fins, you know, so you're using the old to make the new, you know, you don't have to evolve all this brand new stuff. So anyway, that's just, that's just how I think about it. Um, deep time is very hard for humans to grasp, it most definitely is. Can you remember when you feel your first really got the concept what triggered your understanding? Well, you know, when I was in classes like we all do, we all do the earth, you know, the calendar year, the cosmic calendar, you know, where you, you, know, you scale the, you know, January one is the origin of the universe or birth of the planet, whichever your starting point is. And then you go to, you know, humans, we show how humans have been just this last sliver. Those analogies work really well. Uh, I have one colleague used to do the toilet paper year. So basically the entire um, year, was a roll of toilet paper, or the entire you know, history of the universe or earth, whatever you want to begin with, it's a roll of toilet paper. And then you'd have people walk across and rip off toilet paper for different transitions. Um, you know, lots of clever things. I, you know, it's funny, you still can't always wrap your head around it, right? I mean, I'll be digging in rocks and be thinking about, wow, this rock is 380 million years old. Every now and then it'll, it'll stun me. But most of the times I'm just doing my job cracking rock. But you know, when you sit back and you think about it, wow, the rock here on the top of this mountain in Antarctica was, when it was an ancient river you know, 380 million years ago, a tropical river with all these fish in it. Then, you know, mind blown, you know, the, um, the disconnect between present and past. So when it first hit me probably was in high school um, where I had a really good teacher who was talking about evolution. We didn't have a much of an evolution curriculum when I was in high school. I mean, it was like one day, one day and don't tell anybody, you know, kind of thing. Um, but we showed them. Um, I can't imagine you toilet paper for that guy. It's too expensive, right? You're not going to waste your money on toilet paper. You know, that's valuable stuff. You'd probably do something else with it. That was, that was done in the pre-coronavirus age. Um, yeah, time is money. Um, a football field's good. Yeah, any analogy you can do to bring it home is, is really great. Um, I missed a question here. Did I miss a question? Uh, we interviewed Dr. Wells last night. He said he was experiencing some pushback. Yeah, I've never, I've never had pushback. The only time I once had kooky emails, I'll occasionally get a kooky email, but was when Tiktaalik was front page news, you know, back in 2006. And then I got some funky emails, but never, I mean, talks, I've given talks, hundreds of talks around the country to, you know, Tulsa, Stillwater, Oklahoma, Greensboro, South Carolina, Birmingham, Alabama. I've given it to places where you'd think there'd be pushback. And the reality is it's quite the opposite because the people who self-select to come to my talks you know, are not that. They're going to be the ones who want to hear about, you know, stories of discovery. Um, yeah, I, I remember, yeah, let's see. Machine tape, yeah. Which transition was the biggest jump? Yeah, it's hard for me to say. I mean, I think it's something like, you know, the origin of bodies going from single cells to multicellularity. Um, you know, there's a lot that had to happen there. But again, the same thing applies. That's the amazing thing. We don't have fossils that, that really show it. But at the level of genomes, you know, many of the tools that cells use to talk together to make a multicellular animal, guess where they arose? In microbes. And what are they doing in microbes? Helping microbes eat each other, talk to each other, you know, reproduce. So it's, again, it's this repurposing thing. Even the origin of bodies didn't require a whole ton of new uh, mechanisms. But I think that's a big one because, and it happened multiple times, you know, not just in animals, it happened in plants, it happened in fungi and algae and so forth. So it's, 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 it's a transition that's been, that's happened um, quite a bit. And by the way, there's a lot of lab work to show that too, but I'd say the origin of bodies, that's a big one, right? It's a big it's going from single cell to whole body. Um, yeah, mass extinctions, uh, they took geological time out of our AP environmental science curriculum. That's not too forward thinking or even backward thinking. It's not thinking, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, do you think the 2006 encounter was an offshoot of the Dover court decision? Which encounter are you talking about? I'm sorry. Um, which 2006 encounter? Oh, you mean the, oh, I'm sorry. In with TikTok? Yeah. Uh, it might've been. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was missing. So, um, yeah, it could have been. Yeah, definitely could have been. Um, 
you know, it's also, you know, once you're in the public eye, there are a lot of crazy people out there. Um, really, it's, you know, I did Colbert a couple times, you know, the next day it was not, it wasn't like anti-evolution, it was just crazy, you know, so there are, there's that element, you know, um, and, uh, and the internet kind of just, and then the anonymity kind of brings that out too. But yeah, 2006 was a little different. Yeah, there was much more attraction for intelligent design. Because remember, we had the White House pushing it. The Bush White House was pushing uh, intelligent design creationism um, in 2005. And you know, when they were pushing it, we were, I, this was on my desk. And, you know, we hadn't announced it yet. I'm like, wait, are they going to let that thing? Um, but yeah, I think some of it might have been related to where we were at the time. Definitely. Yeah, earth science keeps on getting reduced to most curricula. Yeah, I mean, that's a shame. That's because, you know, I, t I tell you, one of the courses that really changed my life was earth science. You know, was, I, I never saw the world earth in the same way again. Road cuts, cliffs. It was game changing for me, particularly historical geology. You know, that was massive. And I, I'm glad to hear some of you are, are, are picking up on that because it's, it's huge. You know, plate tectonics. How could you be science literate in our world today and not know plate tectonics? That one of the greatest, it's like evolution. It's a unifying concept that, you know, scientific revolution that changed the way people do their research. I mean, that's just like, you know, um, uh, just remarkable. So I'm sorry to hear that, that, that our science is being cut, but I, I think it's very important to slip it in. Yeah, yay rocks most definitely. Um, which modern day species which ha would have a similar organ, internal organ design? I mean, to Tiktaalik, I would say lungfish. So lungfish are their closest living relatives. Lungfish have lungs, they have gills. Um, they have a fin with a humerus, an upper arm bone inside, living lungfish. Um, they are very similar in some ways, not in others. They, have, they still have a conical head, not a flat head, things like that. But they're close enough that we can use them to approximate, we think, some of the soft tissue um, structures in, in a fish like uh, Tiktaalik. Um, yeah, I mean, I think about, I mean, somebody is still talking about geology, it's right. I mean, kids of all ages love rocks, they do. And when you think about rocks, and when you think about landscapes like this, historically, it changes the way you think about you know the planet and and your and your and your relationship to it, and so, yeah, I think I, I, I'm I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't realize that that was happening across the country that we were losing our science curricula in many places. Um, I teach in my I teach an intro class at Chicago, and um, you know, earth science is a big part of it. It's in the biology department, but I you know I throw in plate tectonics in case they haven't really heard it. And you know, it's the origin story is really just the greatest. You know how it all came together. Do you see yourself as a science activist? Uh, more of a science education activist. Um, I believe that we have, if we have a populace that's informed about science, we'll make better decisions. If we have a, and it's not just informed about science, you know, the facts, how it happens. See, right now as a society, we're getting a real time lesson into science being done. You know, if you look at Twitter, you look at what's going on with the COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, you know, we're getting a real time look at science and it's not always pretty but that's how science is you know you're we're fumbling in the dark and we're, we're we're trying to gain evidence and so people are coming out with hypotheses papers which are unpeer reviewed because they're coming coming out fast but you know we're seeing different ideas every day and the public's looking at what do i believe how do the scientists don't know what they're doing oh the scientists know what they're doing they're getting evidence you know and they're making hypotheses based on the limited evidence they have at the time some of them are going to be right some of them are going to be wrong but what a lot of scientists are going to do is as we get more evidence they're going to change their mind you know, and so we're going to, we're, we're seeing, you know, the, the power of science, but we're in, in real time, it's not very pretty to the general public. But I think we have to convey that that's how it works. You know, we're gaining evidence and it's the power of the evidence and people are arguing over evidence. And, you know, we have disagreements, you know, how, how many asymptomatics are there for, you know, for, for COVID-19? Well, a lot of depends on the denominator, right? How many, how many, how many people are, have, have it? Um, well, we don't know that. It's basic data. And so how do we get those data? How do we think about those data? How do we evaluate the data we have? I think it's a, it's a great lesson for students to see that and to show that, you know, science is about changing your mind. It's one of the few areas where we have to change our mind in the face of new evidence, you know, and not all people are good at it, you know, but it's what the enterprise does. Um, how confident, okay, um, this, okay, this game, yeah, I do have to go through fairly soon. I have to, some kids I got to take care of. Um, as a teacher at the university level, what are your thoughts about the caliber of students back in the day? I'd say the students I'm getting now are uh, like an order of magnitude better than back in the day. I mean, the students I'm getting are mind blowing. And I don't think that's just University of Chicago. I think that's what 
something's going well, you know, and I think science education is taken more seriously. So thank you for your work. Uh, I think they have really resources at their fingertips. You know, I know we make fun that, you know, your Google search does not equal my PhD, but there's something about being able to, you know, do a Google search and to satisfy the, their curiosity that's important. And so now there's an outlet for curiosity that there really kind of wasn't in the same way. So I'm actually seeing the students are coming in much more sophisticated. Now that's not, I'm noticing other problems though. They're sophisticated with their science education and background from high school, but they're not good writers. I mean, the art of writing is really suffering. And so I would say at a certain level, they're definitely much better. At another level, they're worse. And so I think in terms of writing, and um, it, it's, it's, yeah, I'm sorry, it's not good. Uh, so I work on that a little bit. Um, how confident were you would find TikTok? Oh, you know, it's confident enough to hang out there for, to do it for six years. Um, we almost didn't go back the last year, um, but we were, we were pretty, we were pretty solid team. We were like, yeah, we can do this. And the rock was looking too good, honestly. And we weren't finding it, but I kept on thinking if we just hit the right spot at the right time, we'll be all right. And it turned out to work that way. Um, how do you explain or describe evolutionary anachronisms? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, evolution can happen at different rates and different taxa. So, and this is actually an open question. I don't have the answers to it. Why do some, why do some lineages like speciate like crazy and others do nothing at all? You know, um, in some species, it may be what they have is just sufficient, you know, that, and that they don't have the right um, genetic background for speciating. Others may have more genetic variation where they can speciate more rapidly. But that's a pretty open question, honestly, why some, you know, lineages are, you know, kind of bushy and have lots of species and others are not bushy at all. So I, 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 I can give you hypotheses, but I don't know how to have a, a kind of true answer for that. So I'll take this as the last question. I'm not, I'll just do two more questions. So um, if you have them. So aside from adding 3D files online for teachers to print and dropping in classrooms, are there other ways that you are trying to make your data and evidence accessible um, at this time? So it's kind of hard for me to do it at this time. So I wrote the book, the book is out there. So if you're interested, check it out. Um, we're doing the drop-ins to classes. We're doing the 3D files. When we publish, we're gonna have a paper, another paper on Tiktaala coming out in about two months. Uh, we're gonna do a press release around that. But we're also gonna do a lot of video tools around it because what it'll be, it'll be a video model of how Tiktaala fed. So you're gonna see a digital model of eating. That'll get wide uh, on social media. I'll be pushing that out quite a bit. And that'll be great for educators because you'll get to see like a, a digital reconstruction based on the actual anatomy of the sutures of these things to how they work. Um, so yeah, that's where we're trying to crank away on that. Thank you. Uh, high school teachers often hear, I don't think humans evolved from monkeys, but that's the least of their problems. Okay. If they're worried about the monkeys, it's the fish that they should be concerned about. What do you think is the conceptual misconception of play that leads them to that theme? And what's the best way to explain it? The best way to explain it, I see it. Uh, well, I see you too. Um, um, the, um, we are, you know, that's why I wrote Interfish, by the way. Um, so, you know, if you look at it, our cousins are, are other species. So I can look at, um, I always begin when I describe this with the family tree. We all have biological families. We have biological parents, our biological parents have their biological parents and on and on and on. And I can use DNA and I can decipher you know, who my cousins and who my ancestors are from that in my own lineage. Well, versions of those same techniques I can apply to other species. And guess what? My family tree extends to primates, to mammals, to reptiles. So it's like peeling an onion. So I like to say that we have a hierarchy of life inside of us. And we see that from multiple lines of evidence from the DNA, which shows us paternity and maternity, if you will, you know, our, our cousinness to each other and to other species. We have the embry embryology that shows, you know, when we compare embryos, similarities and differences among different species, but also we have the fossils and the fossils we can target to show us these transitions. So I can trace the humerus of Tiktaalik from Tiktaalik to amphibians, to reptiles, you know, to mammals, to primates, to people. I can do that with the radius and ulna from a fish all the way up. So we can trace these things. And so it's really about the quality of the evidence. And it's all about having different lines of evidence come together. So yeah, so I think, you know, describing like the layers inside of us, like peeling an onion, like first you see the similarities we, we have with primates, the pretty obvious. Then when you look deeper, you see the similarities we have with mammals. Then you see the similarities we have with reptiles and on and on and on, all the way down to fish, and not down, to fish and, um, and worms and so forth. 
Uh, thank you, everybody. So, yeah, thank you for the high, high praise about the book. Thank you. So, if you bought a book, that made, that doubled my sales. <laughs> so, thanks, John. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Um, it was a great meeting, and uh, thank you for the work you do. Uh, thank you for the fabulous questions. Um, and yes, yeah, stay healthy. And I wish the best to you, your families, and your students. And Dr. Shubin, can't thank you enough for your kindness and your generosity of time to, to share with us. These are some of the toughest days I think we as teachers have ever had. And to be able to spend some time with you is certainly a bright spot in the midst of what I call the great quarantine. And I- Well, I'm glad. I've been getting a bunch of messages on the side here um, from folks who are saying, how awesome you are. So I know if we were in person, there would be a standing ovation. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks all. Take care. Stay healthy. Thanks. Stay happy. All right. And keep up the Bye. great work. Bye-bye.